Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel and welcome to the next series of videos in Creep Week. As you guys can tell, Creep Week has turned into two weeks because we are talking about some of the creepiest cases out there in spirit of Halloween. So the case that I have for you guys today, as you can tell by the title, is a serial killer case. Unlike the case that we covered last week where we didn't know the perpetrator, we spent a lot of time talking about the victims, who they were, trying to put together a timeline to see if they could be connected things like that. We actually do know the person responsible for these murders, so in this case, we're going to be talking about the victims, who they were, and who the perpetrator is. So in this case, we're just going to be talking about what happened, how he got away with it for so long, and all of the misjustices that happened within the justice system as this case goes along. I do just want to warn you guys that this case will frustrate you, it will disgust you. There is a lot of things in this case that do deserve a trigger warning just in terms of how these victims were found and how they were treated. So just so you guys know for that, it is really disgusting how this person was able to get away with what he did for so long. It's really frustrating to see how the justice system handled his case and all of that. So just a fair warning before we dive into this case. Just like the last series, this will be split into two videos because there's just so much to go over. In my opinion, I find it so much easier to digest and take in all the information when it's split into two versus trying to go through it all at one time. So this will be split into two parts. In part one, we will be discussing the initial victims of Rodney Alcala, his jail sentences, and how he was able to get away with the initial victims for so long. In part two, we will be discussing the remainder of his victims, how he was caught, and the mess of trials that took place as a result. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you're anything like me and you have trouble seeing just like me, then you know just how expensive it can be and how much of a hassle it can be to get your glasses directly from the eye doctor. However, GlassesUSA.com has made that process so much easier and so much more affordable. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses including in-home brands like Muse, which is what I'm wearing right now. And then I also have my Amelia E eyeglasses, which is what these ones are. These are my everyday glasses that I wear morning and night. I love these ones. I also have these Audido glasses, which I love to wear if I have a day where I need to wear my glasses all throughout the day. I need them to match with whatever outfit I'm wearing. These are my go-to. Those are definitely my top three favorite brands. I love Amelia E, Muse, and Audido. You guys always hear me talking about these brands of glasses. I just think they're so cute. They look so good on me, and they have so many different options to choose from. I love having extra pairs of glasses. I always have one in my purse, just in case if my contacts are bothering my eyes that day. I have one in my work bag. I have one in my overnight bag in case I end up sleeping over at a friend's house and I forget to pack my contacts or my actual pair of glasses that I usually have with me. I like having the extra pair because again I can't really see so it would be a disaster if I didn't have any with me and I'm also a very forgetful person. I also like to have extra pairs of sunglasses because my eyes are very sensitive to the light. I always keep a pair of sunglasses in my car. I always have one again in my work bag and in my purse because no matter where I am I always need a pair of sunglasses because the sun in Arizona it's intense and it always hurts my eyes. I also love that GlassesUSA.com offers designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine as well as specialty glasses like kids glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, and so many more. Also with GlassesUSA.com, you can add any prescription to almost any pair of frames including sunglasses and blue light blocking glasses, which is what I'm wearing right now. These are really nice for when there's days that I'm just on my computer all day researching a case that takes me hours just so I'm not having that harmful blue light constantly going into my eyes. If you can't figure out what glasses you want just 
based on scrolling online, they also offer this really cool try-on feature where you will put a picture of yourself in to see how the glasses will look on you before you actually spend the money to buy them, which is really helpful for me because again, I never know what kind of glasses I want. So I just put in a picture of myself, I try on the glasses virtually, and I am able to pick out a pair. The best part, of course, is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. All you do is enter your prescription online, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders, no matter where you are. And if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, GlassesUSA.com offers 14 days for a full refund exchange or 100% store credit, no questions asked, and hassle-free. The exciting news is that by using the link in my description box below, my subscribers can get 65% off of their first pair of glasses, which is such a great deal considering they are already so affordable. So again, make sure you use my link down below and get 65% off of your first pair of glasses. Thank you again so much to glassesusa.com for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. With that being said, I am going to take off my glasses for the remainder of the video. I know the glare bothers a lot of people, so I don't want that to be an issue as we go throughout the rest of the video. Okay, so let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of the dating game killer. It was September of 1978 when a man named Rodney Alcala appeared on a reality TV show called The Dating Game as Bachelor Number One. The show's host, Jim Lang, introduced Rodney as a successful photographer who got his start when he was only 13 years old when his father found him in the dark room developing photos. He announced that in his free time, Rodney can be found skydiving or riding a motorcycle. Cheryl Branshaw, the bachelorette, had an exchange on the show where she asked him different questions about himself. He said that his favorite time of the day is the nighttime because that's when it gets really good. Cheryl said, quote, I'm serving you for dinner. What are you called and what do you look like? To which bachelor number one replied, I'm called the banana and I look really good. And she said, can you get more descriptive? And he said, Peel me, to which Cheryl said, later Bachelor one, later. Of course, this drew laughter from the audience. Cheryl was drawn in by Rodney's good looks, clever comebacks, and his charm. So, she ended up choosing Rodney as the one she wanted to go out on a date with. They were awarded with tennis lessons, complete with tennis outfits, and a trip to the Magic Mountain theme park in California. Their name, age, occupation, or income, okay? And we're going to start by having them say hello to you and see how they sound. Number one, would you say hello to Cheryl, please? We're going to have a great time together, Cheryl. Okay. And here we go. Bachelor number one. Yes. What's your best time? The best time is at night, nighttime. Why do you say that? Because that's the only time there is. The only time? What's wrong with the uh, morning, afternoon? Well, they're okay, but night times when it really gets good, then you're really ready. I'm a drama teacher, and I'm going to audition each of you for my private class. Bachelor number one, you're a dirty old man. Take it. Oh, come on, over here. <sighs> <sighs> Number one, I am serving you for dinner. Oh. <laughs> what are you called and what do you look like? I'm called the banana and I look really good. Uh, can you be a little more descriptive? <laughs> Peel me. <laughs> One later. <laughs> Welcome back to the dating game, and Cheryl, we have reached the moment of truth, as we call it. You've heard from the bachelors, you got some great dramatic presentations, some good answers, but now I'm going to ask you a question. Will that date be bachelor number one, bachelor number two, or bachelor number three? Who gets the date? Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one, bachelor number one, all right. Well, there they go. 
However, you did leave one remaining, and this is your date, and I want to tell you something about him, Cheryl. He's a skydiver, so he's got a lot of nerve. He's into motorcycling. He's also a fine photographer. Say hello to Rodney Alcala. Rodney, come on and say hello. Congratulations, Rod. You did it with the one answer. But after the show, Cheryl called in to the show's producers and told them that she didn't want to go on a date with Rodney anymore. And it's a good thing she made that choice because little did she or anybody else at the time know that Bachelor number one was a rapist and a registered sex offender, and he had also killed multiple young girls, teenagers, and young women and he showed no signs of stopping anytime soon. So now let's get into the life and the crimes of the man who would later go on to be known as the dating game killer or Rodney Alcala. Rodney Alcala was born as Rodrigo Jax Alcala Bacour in San Antonio, Texas on August 23rd, 1943 to his parents Raul Alcala and Maria Gutierrez. He had two older siblings, Raul Jr. and Marie, and one younger sister also named Maria. He and his family grew up in San Antonio in a four-bedroom home with his parents, siblings, and maternal grandmother. He had his own bedroom, and so did his brother, but his sisters had to share a room. Religion was something that was very important to the Alcala family. When they were growing up, all of the children attended either private or public Catholic schools. When he was in elementary school, Rodney was described as being a good student. He was said to have above average intelligence, he was always getting excellent grades, and he was always known to stay out of trouble. However, by 1951, Rodney's grandmother became very ill, and the family knew that they just did not have a lot of time left with her, so Rodney's parents decided that they were going to move the family back to Mexico, which is where they were originally from. They wanted to make sure that his grandmother could be surrounded by her family. They wanted her to be able to live in the area that she grew up in before she died. In Mexico, the children started attending normal public schools. This was something that the girls were really excited about because that meant that they no longer had to wear school uniforms. They stayed there for two or three years before Rodney's grandmother did ultimately pass away. After this, Rodney's father actually left the family back in Mexico and he went by himself to the United States. The rest of the family stayed in Mexico for the following three years before they also moved back to the States when Rodney was 11 years old. They settled into a home in the suburbs of Los Angeles, California. Now, obviously, Rodney's father abandoning the family was very traumatic for all of them. Then moving countries and then going from a two-parent household to only having a single mother the family was going through a lot. However, after moving back to the US, life seemed to be going pretty well for Rodney, and he continued to excel all throughout his high school years. He got really good grades, performing at the top of his class. He was known to have a ton of friends, and he was well-liked by the girls at his school as he was always going on dates with them. It was said in some sources that after Rodney's father abandoned the family, he got remarried and had this whole new life and wanted absolutely no contact with Rodney or his mother or his siblings but it was stated in some other sources that they did keep contact after the family moved back to the US, so I'm not exactly sure which one it is. Now, Rodney's older brother would go on to join the US Army after he had attended West Point. So by 1961, Rodney followed suit and he also enlisted in the US Army. He ended up at Fort Bragg in North Carolina and he started working as a paratrooper and a clerk. However, only about a year after leaving for the army, Rodney found out that his father suddenly passed away. Now, I wasn't able to find out information as to why, but he was relatively young and this left Rodney absolutely traumatized. So, he left North Carolina to attend his father's funeral, but he returned shortly after to resume his services in the U.S. Army. But after only two years of serving, by 1963, there was one random day where Rodney suddenly showed up at his mother's home one evening, completely out of the blue. Maria was confused and she asked Rodney why he showed up back home and he told her that he had just decided to leave the army and he hitchhiked back home. 
His mother thought that he had just randomly left and was trying to escape his responsibilities, so this really concerned her. She urged him to go back because she didn't want him to lose everything that he had worked so hard for in the army. However, it actually turned out that Rodney had been discharged from the army for medical reasons. Rodney was no longer able to perform his duties in the military because he seemed to be struggling with having some sort of nervous breakdown. It was said in some sources that Rodney had also been accused of sexual abuse while in the army, but I wasn't able to find any further information about that. So, after he was discharged, he did go to the hospital for treatment, and there he was examined by an army psychologist. This psychologist actually diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder and this person suggested that he no longer enlist in the army. After this, Rodney started school at the University of California, Los Angeles at the School of Fine Arts. According to his professors and his peers, he did exceedingly well in school. He was intelligent, charismatic, and charming. However, Rodney would go on to commit some of the most disturbing crimes imaginable at this time. Rodney's first known crime was on September 25th, 1968. It was morning time when eight-year-old Tally Shapiro was walking down Sunset Boulevard on her way to school at Gardner Elementary. Tally's family had recently had to stay at the Chateau Marmont Hotel in West Hollywood because her house had actually burned down. However, the family obviously didn't mind staying there because it is one of the nicest hotels on Sunset Boulevard. It has huge, beautiful rooms with balconies that overlooked the streets of Hollywood. It had awesome pools, gorgeous gardens, and was frequented by many stars, including Marilyn Monroe. Rodney had been driving his convertible down the strip when he noticed Tali happily walking down the sidewalk and singing. He slowed his car down next to her and yelled out, hey sunshine, do you need a ride. This actually startled Tali and she almost tripped to stop and turn around to see who was yelling to her. She told him that she was on her way to school and he said, that's okay, I'll take you to school. She asked him if he knew where her school was and he said, of course he does. He seemed like a very nice man. He had a gentle smile across his face when he was talking to her. So she smiled back and accepted the ride. She knew at this time, obviously, that she wasn't supposed to be talking to strangers, but at the same time, she was taught to respect her elders, so she just did what she was told. So, he leaned over and opened the door from the inside, and Tali jumped into the convertible. When she was in, Rodney noticed that she had a little bit of a floral smell to her. So, he asked her, what is that lovely smell, but she's eight, she wasn't wearing perfume or deodorant or anything else most likely, so she didn't really know what to say. She just said she didn't know. He replied by saying that she smells like a lovely flower. Rodney put his car into drive and started down the road, and as they rode, Tali continued smiling and singing, feeling the wind going through her hair as she was riding in the convertible. At this point, she was expecting to shortly arrive to school. However, they soon pulled up to a building that to her either looked like a hotel or an apartment building, and they stopped there. Tali said, this isn't my school, to which Rodney replied, I know that, I just need to get something from my apartment first, is that okay? Tali said, I don't want to be late, I don't want to get in trouble, to which Rodney replied, don't worry about that, I'll come into the school with you and I'll explain that it was my fault, okay? And she said, okay. Then he got out of the car and walked over to the passenger side of the car and opened the door for her. And he asked her if she wanted to come inside with him and she looked down at her feet and said, I don't know. He said, oh, come on, I have some candy that you can have, it will only be a minute. So he smiled at her again and opened the door for her and asked her to come out. She meekly stepped out and Rodney closed the car door behind her. He took her hand and led her up three flights of stairs to his apartment. He unlocked the door and took her inside. However, throughout this entire interaction, there had actually been a witness who saw him following this little girl and watched her get into his car. A man named Donald Haynes noticed that this man was driving a beige-colored car without a license plate following this little girl. 
Donald thought that it was really suspicious, so suspicious that he actually followed them all the way to his apartment. Remember, it's the 60s, so there's no cell phones to immediately call the police to report this suspicious situation, so Donald went to the nearest payphone and he dialed the LAPD to report this suspicious incident. LAPD officer Chris Camacho was the one who responded to the call. He arrived at Rodney's apartment, knocked on the door, and announced that he's a police officer and he needed to speak with him immediately. I do believe that the front door was one of those doors that has like a window at the top where you can see the other person through each side because according to the officer, he saw Rodney's face and he told him to open the door, but Rodney said that he can't open the door, that he's getting dressed, he just took a shower, so it'll take a couple of minutes. So the officer told him that he had 10 seconds to open the door. A few minutes passed, so Officer Camacho kicked down the door and immediately he was horrified at what he saw. From the front door, he could see a little body laying on the floor surrounded by a pool of blood. As he kicked down the door, other officers who had been called were getting there very quickly and they were all rushing in to mend help. Officer Camacho said, quote, they say a picture says a thousand words and that image of those little white Mary Janes on that floor with that metal bar that he used to strangle her and that puddle of blood, it just looked like too much blood to come out of a tiny little eight-year-old like that. She had been raped. There was no breathing and I thought she was dead. We all thought she was dead. Rodney Akala had brutally beaten this eight-year-old little girl with a steel pipe and he raped her. Officer Camacho said that he grabbed the nearest towel that he could and picked up up the edge of the bar and then put it to the side. Then, in his words, he witnessed a miracle. She was gagging. She was trying to breathe and Officer Camacho said that in that moment, he knew that she was going to make it. He saw this as God giving little Tali a second chance at life. So, of course, she was rushed to the hospital and treated for her injuries and she survived. She was in the hospital for several months, but eventually she was able to get out and she was well enough to return to school and move on with her life. After leaving the hospital, Tali's family actually left the U.S. and moved to Mexico. They did not want to be anywhere near that man or the society that allowed this man to hurt their little girl. However, within all of the craziness of all of this happening with Officer Camacho kicking down that door and then the officers rushing in and tending to Tali, Rodney got away. He slipped out of the back door and he fled. So, obviously, he was not arrested at this time, but the officers did go and search throughout his apartment to see if they could find any information about who this man was. That is when they found a bunch of photography equipment. They also found photographs of a bunch of young girls all around the apartment. This is also when they found a student ID from UCLA that had the name Rodney Alcala on it. As police started their investigation at this point, it seemed like they were just hitting dead ends from the very beginning. Again, they did not have the same amount of tools or resources that we have access to today. There were no cell phones to track. There was no surveillance videos of him. There was no car GPS. There was nothing. So, all they had to rely on was tips and information that they gathered from talking to those around him who knew Rodney. But investigators knew that they had a very long road ahead of them because Everybody that they talked to just could not believe that Rodney would do something like this. They went to speak with Rodney's professors at UCLA and all of them said things like, Rodney wouldn't hurt a fly and he's a gifted student. He would never do something like that. No one in the area or who knew him believed that this charming, gifted young college student could be responsible for something so heinous. You also have to remember this is the 1960s. This is before true crime documentaries. This is before we knew that so many people who seem normal can commit these disgusting heinous crimes. So at the time, all they knew was this person who they thought they knew was being accused of something so horrific and they just could not believe that he would be capable of that. So the LAPD turned to the FBI for help in capturing Rodney. 
he was added to the FBI's most wanted list by 1969 because they truly believed that he would continue to commit crimes until he was caught. Now I want to pause and talk about Cornelia Crilly. She was not connected to Rodney until decades later, but I didn't really find another time to fit this into the video but she is the next known victim at this time. Cornelia was 23 years old and was working as a flight attendant living on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. She had grown up in Bayside, Queens in New York. By June 24th, 1971, Cornelia's boyfriend realized that he hadn't been able to get into contact with her all day. So when police went in and did a wellness check on her, they walked into a horrific scene. They found her body laying in her apartment dead after she had been strangled with her own stockings. She had clothing stuffed into her mouth and she had been brutally raped. Police found that her front door had been locked and there was no sign of forcible entry, so this left police very confused. However, she had just recently moved into this new apartment in Manhattan, so they thought that maybe she had hired someone to help her move furniture and that this person was the person responsible. And that is where this case was left for a very, very long time. We will discuss much later when she was finally connected to Rodney. So now going back into the investigation for Rodney of the crimes that police did know about at the time. Police continued to follow leads and they questioned anybody that they could, but they didn't seem to be getting anywhere closer to finding Rodney. That was until August 12th, 1971. So, there were two teenagers who were staying in this all-girls summer camp in New Hampshire who visited the post office one day to mail out some letters. However, once inside, they noticed something on the bulletin board. Now, back then, the FBI would print out their most wanted lists and post them all around that they could so that, you know, anybody who recognized them could see them on the flyer and report that they knew them. These two girls noticed that a man on the FBI's most wanted list looked very familiar to them. They thought that this picture of Rodney Alcala looked just like their camp counselor, Mr. Berger. They definitely saw a striking resemblance between the two men, but they knew that Mr. Berger was very friendly. He was charming and very kind. Plus, the man on this poster was wanted out of California and they were all the way across the country in New Hampshire. But nonetheless, they showed their camp's Dean the picture and he studied the picture very closely and he did see the resemblance and he thought that it was possible that Mr. Berger was actually Rodney Alcala. So he called the FBI who told him that they'd be sending out an officer shortly, but they told him for the time being to act completely normal and don't give Mr. Berger any sort of reason to think that you're suspicious. So that next day, officers showed up and detained Mr. Berger and they compared his fingerprints to Rodney Alcala and they completely matched. So this person who was wanted out of California was this man who is now living in New Hampshire. So they contacted agents in California and told them that they have their suspect. Turns out, Rodney had still graduated from UCLA, but he left California and moved to New York, where he enrolled in NYU's film school under the name of John Berger. Once again, those around him described him as being one of the best film students that they had ever seen. He was well-liked, he was intelligent, and nobody thought that he could hurt a fly. By summer break in 1971, he had gotten this new job as a camp counselor at the New Hampshire Arts Camp under the same name, John Berger, spelled with an E. So after finding him, he was extradited back to California where detectives sat down with Rodney and asked him all about Tali Shapiro. To this, he literally said, oh, I forgot all about that. I don't wanna talk about the things that Rod Alcala did as if it was a different person, because to him, he was John Berger, not Rodney Alcala. Either way, prosecutors in this case were in a bad spot because, like I said, Tali and her family had moved away from the U.S. and to Mexico, so they were not available to testify. Investigators couldn't even get a hold of her family, so this created some logistical problems for the DA. So, Rodney ended up taking a plea deal for lesser charges of child molestation, which I don't think should be lesser charges in general, 
but this was in 1972 and he was sentenced to one year in jail for this crime. So his sentence was technically one year to life, which is an indeterminate sentence. This means that the duration is not set in stone, more so a range based on other outside factors. Whereas a fixed determinant sentence is a set amount of time, so five years. If they are sentenced to five years, they will serve five years. The only way to get out early is on good behavior or overcrowding. So because this was an indeterminate sentence, the goal wasn't necessarily punishment, it was rehabilitation. And the parole board would consider things like victim impact and the family's concerns, as well as a psychiatric evaluation. But again, the family wasn't there to testify. They weren't there to talk about how this affected their little girl. So after serving only 34 months in jail, a prison psychiatrist thought that Rodney seemed to have improved considerably since the time that he had started his time there. So he recommended that Rodney be released. So in August of 1974, after brutally beating and raping an eight-year-old little girl, he was released he did have to register as a sex offender, but other than that, he was a free man. Rodney went back to move in with his mother in Los Angeles. Here, he had his private room with a private entrance, meaning that he could come into his bedroom through a door that led directly into his bedroom so he didn't have to go in using the front door. He was allowed to use his mother's car whenever he wanted, and around this time, he also got a job with a photography company where he took photos of stores in South LA. Not long after, Rodney continued on with his crime spree, Imagine that a child predator is released from prison and he just continues to prey on children. Who would have thought? It was October 13th, 1975, when Rodney pulled into the parking lot of a mall in Huntington Beach, California. Here, he saw a little girl waiting for her school bus holding a stack of books. Her name was written on these books, so he quickly figured out her name. He yelled out to the little girl named Julie Johnson, saying, hey Julie, I can take you to school if you'd like. She didn't answer him at first, but he continued talking to her, saying that he has some posters that he can show her. Again, he looked at her with a smile and he charmed her. He told her how cool it would be if she got to ride to school in a convertible versus an old school bus. So, he pulled up to her and asked her how old she is and she told him that she's 13 years old, but she often is told that she looks a lot younger. He introduced himself as John Ronald and she introduced herself as Julie. She then got into his car and off they went. However, once they passed Julie's school, Julie got anxious and started telling him to stop because they had just passed her school, obviously. Once again, he told Julie that he needed to stop at his apartment to check in on something and that it wouldn't be long, but Julie got more and more antsy and this just made Rodney mad. He started yelling at her to sit still and this made her scream out of fear. Rodney told her to shut up, and this is when she tried getting out of a moving car. Once the car then stopped, she tried opening the door once again, but as she was trying to run out, Rodney grabbed her arm in such a firm grip that she just could not get away. They then pulled up to Huntington Beach, and this is when he dragged her up to a hiking trail, and he sat her on a rock. He then pulled out a joint of marijuana and forced her to smoke it with him, after she took a hit, she passed it back to him, but as she was doing so, she dropped it on the ground on purpose. When he bent down to grab it, she tried to use this as an opportunity to run away, but he grabbed her leg, pulled her in, and kissed her forcibly. But luckily, there was a park ranger walking nearby and he could see them rustling around up there. So he went up to them and once the park ranger got closer, he noticed the smell of weed. So he went up to them and asked them what they were doing and Rodney said that they're just going on a hike. But Julie told the park ranger that she had been forced to go there with him and that she wanted to go home. So the ranger 
handcuffed Rodney and the both of them were driven to the police station to tell their stories. Of course, Rodney tried saying that she's the one who brought weed. She's the one who made him go up to this hiking trail and she tried forcing him to smoke weed with her. Obviously, Julie denied this and then the officer at the police station did go ahead and run a background check on Rodney and they saw that he was a registered sex offender and he was on parole. So, he was charged with counts of selling weed, kidnapping, and violating his parole and he was taken back to jail. By December, he was found guilty of violating his parole as well as supplying a minor with drugs but not for kidnapping for these charges, he returned to prison for two years. I think that's the problem with people's charges only being listed under this one blanket general title. All I saw was that he was a registered sex offender, which I don't think is a good general title because that could mean that, you know, he was 19 years old and he slept with his 15-year-old girlfriend who did consent and now he has to register because that's statutory rape. It could mean that, like he did, he's an adult who raped and beat an eight-year-old little girl and left her on the floor to die. Both of those things are registered sex offender and that's the only thing that popped up, so they didn't know the actual details of his horrific crime if they knew that he had beaten and raped an eight-year-old little girl and left her for dead in his apartment maybe they would have known that this 13-year-old little girl didn't go with him willingly but I'm sure because she was 13 years old, they probably assumed that she went with him willingly to smoke weed because that's apparently what teenagers do and that, you know, she wasn't actually forced to go, that after she got there, maybe he was acting a little bit suspicious and that's when things turned bad and that's why he was only charged with supplying drugs to a minor. So, I think that's why he wasn't ultimately charged with kidnapping, but if they knew his actual history, maybe he would have been actually charged with kidnapping and maybe he would have been in jail a lot longer. Either way, he was released by 1977 and once again, he was a free man. Once again, he came out of prison and got a job. This time, he was a typesetter for the Los Angeles Times. He had also worked as a wedding photographer. He obviously was still registered as a sex offender, but I guess at this time, no one was doing background checks on him or they just didn't care that he was a sex offender. Maybe he talked his way out of it and explained it as a much lesser situation than it was. I don't really know, but he was able to get all of these jobs despite being a registered sex offender. But of course, as we know, he did not stop with this last victim. His next victim was a 23-year-old woman from New York City. Her name was Ellen Hoover, and she was a recent graduate of Beaver College in Glendale, Pennsylvania. Here, she had a degree in biology with a minor in music. She had a deep love for music and she was a gifted piano player. She had aspirations of going to medical school after graduating from Beaver College. She had lived in a Manhattan apartment alone just a few yards away from the Empire State Building. Now, even though Rodney was on parole, he did get permission from his parole officer to travel to New York City. By July 13th, 1977, Ellen was seen by a witness speaking with a tall, thin man with a ponytail right outside of her apartment building. Later, after this interaction, the witness, who was a friend of Ellen's, asked her who this man was and she told him that it was a photographer who wanted to take pictures of her. She described that this man was kind of pressuring her to have lunch with him, but she was too nice to say no. Those around Ellen remember her as being such a sweet, kind-hearted young woman, so Given that this man seemed like a nice person, he went to UCLA, he studied at NYU, and he worked with kids. She thought that he seemed fine. So, by July 15th, the two had set up a time to meet. She met with this man at her apartment for lunch. However, after that, no one had seen or heard from her ever again. She had plans that night for dinner with her boyfriend. She had also called her parents on a daily basis, but after that, nobody had heard from her. She was immediately reported missing and an officer went to her apartment to investigate 
and once again, they found no signs of a struggle or a break-in. But what they did find was that in her journal, she wrote the name John Berger Photographer listed for July 15th. Her family ended up hiring a private investigator to find this man, and they put out a $100,000 reward in efforts to find her. However, it was around this time that the son of Sam Killer had also been going around New York and shooting young people in their cars, so there was a lot of effort being put into that case as well, so once again, Rodney slipped through the cracks. He spent about a month in New York before he headed back to LA and continued working full-time for the LA Times. It wasn't until about a year later, in 1978, that police received a tip saying that Rodney likes to do his photography sessions during the sunset at the cliffs above the Hudson River. So, police started searching through that area a lot more intensely. They had actually searched this area 24 times before but this time they found a pair of women's underwear and a bra that they thought belonged to Ellen. So at this time they started searching for a body in the area and that is when she was found. Ellen's remains were found in a shallow grave in North Terrytown in Westchester County. The next victim we have is Jill Barcombe. Jill Barcombe was born on December 18th, 1958 to her parents Maurice and Joyce. She was the fifth child out of 11 total children in her family with five brothers and five sisters. She was from Oneida, New York, and she volunteered at a local hospital with dreams of someday becoming a nurse. Her family described her as being a bubbly, happy girl who was tiny, only weighing 90 pounds, but she had such a big personality and she definitely had her wild side to her. She wanted to get out of New York and she wanted to go to California to experience life on her own. By October of 1977, Jill had suddenly disappeared and her family was worried sick. However, a week later, Jill called her parents to let her know that her and three friends had decided to drive all the way to California but she loved it so much in California that she said that she was going to stay there even though the three friends that had originally went out with her did return back to New York. By November 10th, 1977, the West Los Angeles police responded to a call regarding a body that was found in the area on Mulholland Drive. They went to the area that was off the road near some dense bush and a gravel side road. This is where they found the body of a female. She had been placed in a very odd position. Her head was bent so far forward into her chest that it looked like her neck had been broken. She was in a position where her head was also touching the ground, so her knees were sort of on the ground and then her body was like that and then her head was under her and touching the ground. Her arms were at her sides on the ground and it was clear that she had been brutally raped and the blood from the rape was pooling below her. She had one pant leg tied around behind her back, and her green sweater was pulled up so far forward that her back was exposed, and she had no shoes or socks on. There was a large boulder nearby that did have blood on it, and she was also found to have been bleeding from her head. At the time, police had no idea who this body belonged to, but they did send her off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. According to the medical examiner, she had been strangled with hands and then some sort of rope before she was then hit in the head with a rock. Her cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to her head and it came out that she had been sodomized. They were actually able to use fingerprints from a juvenile arrest record to identify her body and this body was confirmed as belonging to Jill Barcombe. Her body was sent back to Oneida, New York, and she was buried at the St. Patrick Cemetery on November 16th, 1977. Only two months after Jill Barcombe's death, another young woman would fall victim to Rodney. Georgia Wickstead was the middle child of three total children, an older brother named Michael and a younger sister named Anna. 
She was raised by her mother, who was widowed, so she did her best to provide for her three children all by herself, but George and Michael helped out as much as they could with taking care of Anna. In her teen years, Georgia found herself with a bunch of different medical troubles. She ended up with two hospital stays after she needed surgery to remove two tumors. Because of this, this led to her dreams of wanting to become a nurse. Georgia worked with her friend, Barbara Gale, in the post-cardiac unit in Centalia Hospital in Inglewood, California. They both had worked their shifts from 3 to 11.30 p.m. on December 15th, 1977. After work, the two friends went out with a third friend to celebrate the third friend's birthday. After this, Georgia dropped her friend Barbara off at her home in Santa Monica. Before dropping Barbara off, Barbara asked Georgia if she would be able to give her a ride again the next day on September 16th at 2.30 for work because her own motorbike had broken down. However, the next day, when it came time for Georgia to pick up Barbara, she didn't show. So, Barbara called Georgia's house several times, but all of her calls were going unanswered. She ended up taking a cab to work, and this is when she realized that Georgia didn't show up for work either. This was very out of character for Georgia to promise to give her a ride, only to just not show up, and then for her to skip work. So, Barbara immediately reported Georgia as a missing person to the LAPD. When police showed up to Georgia's house, they immediately noticed that the screen on the window had been removed. Then, they noticed that there was a box on the ground in front of the window outside as if someone had put it there and then climbed up on it in order to enter the house. When they knocked on the door without an answer, they entered the home through an unlocked front door. Immediately, when they walked in, they noticed that it was unbearably hot and completely dark. Very quickly, they noticed what looked to be a dead body on the floor, and unfortunately, this body did belong to a young woman, and it turned out to be Georgia. She was laying face up with her knees pointing outwards, creating a diamond shape with her legs, there was blood on her legs and pantyhose knotted around her neck. Her bed sheets, pillows, and blankets were all scattered across the floor next to her and they were all covered in blood. They also found a hammer laying next to her body and this also had blood on it. In the rest of the house, there was blood everywhere. It was on her mattress, on the bedroom walls, on the bathroom walls, on the toilet, and there was even a bloody towel in the kitchen sink. Of course, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy and these findings were just horrific. She had multiple skull fractures, she had ligatures on her head, she had a broken jaw and a broken neck, and there were ligature marks around her neck as well. Clearly, she had been hit with a hammer multiple times, she had been strangled, and she had been brutally raped. At the same time, in December of 1977, the LAPD received a call from the FBI, who at that time were investigating the death of Ellen Hoover, who had gone missing five months prior. They asked them if they were familiar with a man named John Berger, since this was the name that had been written down in Ellen's journal. And of course, they knew that Rodney Alcala had used that name before. They also found that Rodney had been in jail twice for a total of five years, and he was now on parole, and he was working for the LA Times. So, police went ahead, found him at work, and took him in for questioning. At the time, he did admit that he knew her. He admitted that he had been on a date with her the night that she disappeared. He said that the two of them were friends and that they would see each other very often and he would take pictures of her and that is what they were doing on the day that Ellen was last seen. He said that after they had hung out together and he took pictures of her, he walked her back to her apartment and that was the last time he saw her. Police asked him if he would take a polygraph test and he declined. So, because they didn't have any other information to hold him on at this time, because remember, this was 1977 and her body wasn't found until 1978, so 
They didn't have any other information to hold him on, so they had to let him go. After this, the next victim is Charlotte Lamb. Charlotte Lamb was the fourth born to a family of eight children. She was born and raised in Ohio on a farm with her family. She loved to paint, sing, and sometimes she even designed and created her own skirts and dresses. She lived in Ohio until she graduated from high school. After this, she decided to head down to LA with her boyfriend. On Friday, June 23rd, 1978, at around 8 p.m., she decided to call a friend to ask him if he wanted to go with her to a new club that had just opened up in Santa Monica. This was a friend that she had known since college, so it wasn't out of the ordinary for her to ask him to come with her to something like this. But he wanted to have a quiet night in that night with his girlfriend, so he he decided not to go. So it seemed that she did end up going to the nightclub that night because she had parked her car illegally behind the club. However, days passed and her car had not moved. She racked up two tickets and by June 29th, her car was finally towed and impounded. Now, June 26th was Charlotte's birthday and that day, obviously, several friends and family members had tried calling her to wish her a happy birthday, but she wasn't answering anybody. So, when her sister noticed that she hadn't gotten back to her within a day, she reported Charlotte as a missing person. By June 28th, detectives showed up to Charlotte's apartment in Santa Monica. They knocked, but they got no answer. When they entered, they saw that the apartment was very clean and organized and nothing seemed to be out of order. However, a few days after this, a resident of an apartment building located in El Segundo, he went down to the laundry room in the basement of the apartment building. That is when he saw the body of a naked woman laying on the ground, and immediately, this man called the police. When police arrived, they saw that she was lying on her back and her body was surrounded in blood. There had been a shoelace wrapped around her neck with the lace still attached to the shoe. Her arms were crossed behind her back and she had been laying on them. She had suffered severe trauma to her head and her face and she had been strangled as well and once again, she had been brutally raped. At the time, police had no idea who this body belonged to, so the police went to the landlord of this apartment building as well as other residents, and it turned out that this woman didn't even live there. However, they were able to ultimately identify the body as belonging to Charlotte Lamb, she had been murdered 13 miles away from where she lived. By September of 1978, Rodney was somehow accepted to be a contestant on the reality show, The Dating Game. At this time, it was already known that he was a rapist and a registered sex offender, so it's not known how he got onto this show in the first place. Either way, as we discussed in the beginning, The Bachelorette, Cheryl Bradshaw, picked Rodney to go out on a date with her. He was handsome, charming, and clever. However, after the show ended, Cheryl called the show's contestant coordinator and told her that she didn't want to go out on this date after all. She said, quote, I can't go out with this guy. There's weird vibes that are coming off of him. He's very strange. I'm not comfortable. Is that going to be a problem? And of course, they said no and they canceled the date. Another contestant on the show described Rodney as being a very strange guy with bizarre opinions. Of course, after Cheryl declined the date, it seemed that Rodney's behaviors grew even more violent. A criminal profiler named Pat Brown said that it might have been this rejection that really exasperated his already very intense hatred towards women. From there, Rodney continues to commit heinous crimes and continues slipping through the cracks of the investigators. But with that, that is where we are going to end part one. Now, part one is going to be a little bit shorter than part two because I figured this was a good place to end this part, but in part two, there's so much more we have to discuss. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through this one. I know this is a lot more of an intense case than we usually go over. It's very graphic. It's very violent. There's a lot of different victims and the things that they went through are just so much more horrific than any of us could want to imagine. 
but their stories still deserve to be shared and discussed. In part two, we will be discussing the remainder of Rodney's victims, how he was caught, and the mess of trials that took place as a result. So you're definitely not going to want to miss part two because that is where we will discuss the resolution to this case. But either way, thank you all again for being here with me for my very first creep week, which ended up being two weeks because I wanted to cover these cases and I figured with the spirit of Halloween, why not? But this month we did get two extra videos out of it, so there's that. That's always a good thing. But either way, thank you all for listening to the stories that we have discussed this far and make sure you keep an eye out for part two that will be up within a day or two of this part. But either way, if you like this video and if you're enjoying Creep Week, please go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week and sometimes two times a week. Make sure you go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos and so you don't miss out on part two. Make sure you use my link down below and head to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first pair of glasses. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send the suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I cannot wait to see you guys in part two. Bye!